Welcome. In this session, I'm going to talk about 15 best practices, some of which about efficiency and some about security using the Microsoft 365 platform. I specialize in maximizing efficiency using the entire Microsoft platform and I've been doing it for quite some time. When it comes to Microsoft platform, most of us do unstructured work. It's not core line of business applications. They are already automated. The work done on office tools is usually unstructured. That means there is no process to it. So if the process is not well defined, how do you know what is efficient and not? So what is exactly efficiency in the context of unstructured work? In manufacturing, you want to produce more output you have to increase the amount of raw material you give. In this case, the raw material is you, your time, your life. So what we want to do is with minimum effort, we want to get maximum impact. Simple definition, but extremely powerful because all the 14,000 plus features of Office platform are designed with this thought process in mind. You will realize this as we go along. So with that, let's see one by one, all the best practices. First thing is do not use Excel for data entry. Excel is designed for analysis, not for data entry. But despite that, many users every day are creating an Excel file, adding columns, sending it by mail, getting the file back, copy paste, copy paste multiple times, clean it up and then analyze. Yes, this happens. Am I right? Does this sound familiar? Does this sound familiar? Yes. Does this sound efficient? Absolutely not. But then why are people doing inefficient things? Nobody wants to remain inefficient, but probably we didn't know that there is a better way. So I will show you a better way. Stop using Excel for data entry, for columnar data entry. Use lists. This is a part of Office 365. Create a list, create columns like you do in Excel. In fact, when you add a column here, you can get many more data types compared to what Excel offers. It also offers validations, row level validations, conditional formatting, mandatory columns, multiple selections, unique values and many, many more things. So really powerful and accurate data can be captured. Now you want other people to enter it, of course, so you share it with specific people, give their email IDs. You can also control whether they can read or edit. In this case, of course, we want them to edit. But the problem is, I don't want them to look at or edit each other's data. So go to settings, advanced settings and just two radio buttons to click. By setting these, people can only edit the data they have added. So that makes it secure. Now, when people get the link, they don't need Excel or any other software. Just a browser and internet connection is enough and they can edit in grid view, which is like Excel. You can even copy paste from Excel if the columns match. Now I'm seeing my view where I can see data entered by everyone, but individual person will see his or her data only. Now, when the data is being entered, I of course want to analyze it, which should be done in Excel. So you do say export to Excel, but remember, this is not a snapshot. You will get a pivot table or raw data, whichever way you want but this is a live link. So you can go to the connection properties and say refresh on open. So it's always going to be the latest report. If you want to keep the file open, it can even refresh it periodically. That's great. Going one step further, if you want some automation to happen whenever a new row is added or changed, you can use Power Apps to do that. You can also create custom user interface using Power Automate and both of these don't require programming. So bottom line, with less effort, we have got better quality data without any copy paste, without attachments. That's called efficiency. Now, in many cases, you do have to do data cleanup. When you capture data in lists, there is no cleanup required because it's already validated. But what if you get data from other sources where it is needing some cleanup? Usually one of these methods is used, but now a complete revolution has happened in terms of what you can do with data cleanup. Whatever method you are using right now for data cleanup, stop doing it and explore how it could be done using Power Query. Power Query is available in Excel under data menu, get and transform. Older version was called 
get external data. This is the new one, Power Query. The same get and transform is available in Power BI as well. And we have browser based, Power BI cloud based data flow where also you can have Power Query on the cloud, which is typically used for cloud based sources, IoT, and stuff like that. Now, in case you have older version of Excel, you can install this add in and you will get a separate tab, but functionality wise is the same. So, what is Power Query? Power Query is a very powerful menu driven, easy to use way of importing and cleaning up data from all kinds of sources. This is just a small list of what Power Query can do, but you'll realize that many of these things you're already doing in some way or the other, and Power Query is 100% better than whatever you're doing. So, how does Power Query differentiate itself from what you do? What do you do today? You get the data. In order to even see the data, whether it is good or bad, you have to import it in Excel, isn't it? And once you export it in Excel, then you have to clean it up. If it is large, everything you do is slow. And then after the cleanup, you make reports. Is the job done? Maybe not, because next time when the data changes, the whole process has to be repeated in a slow manner. So obviously it's bad. Now, when you use Power Query, the first benefit beyond the cleanup part is Power Query can get a small sample of the data. Let's say I give it a CSV file which has 1 million rows. That file doesn't even open in a normal editor, but Power Query will take only first thousand rows, show them to you, ask you what kind of cleanup do you want to do, then it will do it. And then only when you have finalized the cleanup, you do the actual import. So it's fast. And if you import the data in data model, which is a part of Excel as well as Power BI, there is no limit on number of rows. You can import millions of rows even in Excel because the data is not going in Excel sheet. You can ask it to put it in data model instead of Excel sheet to eliminate that limit. And the best part of Power Query is whatever cleanup steps you have taken, it remembers. It's like recording a macro conceptually. And then next time when the data is updated, assuming the data source and location is same, you just have to say refresh and you can even automate the refresh if you want. So bottom line, this is absolutely revolutionary and you will save enormous amount of time, number one, and the quality of your data will improve. And the time which you have saved, you should invest in analysis because that is a value adding activity. So that is how Power Query revolutionizes everything. Now, what happens when you have the report? You have got the data, somehow cleaned it, made report, copy paste to PPT, all that is done. Now you're presenting. You are ready with the standard reports, but some new questions are bound to come. Now, what do you do? Typically, the response is, yes, of course, I will tell you the answer to that question, but I will have to go back, analyze the data, and then I will get back to you. That is a bad idea because it's nobody's fault, but everyone's time got wasted. Not a good thing. We want to utilize that time because everyone has come for the meeting review, whatever. So if we could answer it there and then, even when we are not prepared, would it not be nice? So, so far we do the same steps, but extra step. The same data you import into Power BI. This time Power BI desktop, which is completely free. Log into powerbi.com and then download Power BI desktop. It's also there in Microsoft Store. Install it. It's completely free for life. The same data you import here, the same Power Query user interface works. And then what do you do? Just carry a blank Power BI file with the data in it, but no visuals, no report. Continue to present as usual from your existing PPT. Of course, new questions are going to come, but now instead of saying, I'll get back to you, what are you going to do? Let me show you. So I'm going to actually show you this in Power BI itself. I have this data. I have city master, which has class, population, state, and amount, expense type, gender, date, something like that. Now I have not created any report. This is just a demo. There are some visuals here, but let's assume we just had a blank page one. No problem. This is also very good because all that you have to do if some someone asks a question, double click here. Just double click empty area. This is called question and answer. If you don't want to do this, you can look at this area called visualizations, visualizations, and you will see something called QA, which is the same visual basically. Double click adds that. And now it's saying, ask me a question, I'll tell you the answer. 
Okay, so I'll say what is the average amount? It's telling you. Now I want to see something more complex. Okay, which state has maximum amount? Right? So it shows you that. Like that, you can ask complex questions also and it's capable of answering just by looking at your existing columns. It's really, really good. While we are at it, there is another brilliant feature. Assume you had a simple chart like this. And in this, we had April 18,000 and May 4,000. Why there is such a decrease? Obvious question. Now, when you are answering that question, you are looking at months and amount. So in this visual, two columns, which is date and amount is already being used. But when you are explaining that decrease, you will have to explain it in terms of some state or class or location or card type or expense type. So you don't have to say, I'll get back to you. Right click on that point and say, analyze, explain the decrease. Now it will look at all the parameters available, all the dimensions as we call them, rank them in the order of influence on that decrease and show you nice waterfall charts. So this is April, this is May and this gap can be explained because the business in gold card went down majority wise. This is the first influencer, but scroll down. Now it is saying class A, C, T and A1 went down, B1 actually went up. Like that, all dimensions are covered. So you are actually looking at your data in a comprehensive manner and you may get some ideas which you may not have seen before. So very, very useful feature. So that's how, what is the logic? Now, even if you carry a blank report, it is going to give you added value and it is going to save your time, everyone's time and speed up decision making. Okay, so the next one. Very often we are doing meetings online hybrid, but before COVID most of the things were in person. Even the smallest conference room would have a whiteboard, isn't it? In fact, in small conference room, whiteboard doubles up as the project projection screen as well. But then when we move to go cloud or online meetings, very often we forget that there is a whiteboard right within Teams. Teams allows you to share screen, window and whiteboard. So if you have not explored the whiteboard, please do so. It's a brilliant feature. It is really, really uh, performant. Multiple people who are in the meeting can simultaneously participate. They don't need a stylus or a touch screen. Just keyboard mouse is enough. So what can you do? You can draw, you can type, you can put sticky notes in isolation or you can put grids like this. You can put reactions and you can, someone can type something and some people are saying, I like it, I don't like it, I have a question. Like that interactive things can happen. But probably the most powerful feature here is called templates. We have many templates available for lots of common use cases or scenarios for which whiteboarding is usually used. So these are some brainstorming templates. We have lots of project planning templates also and so on. So start using this whiteboard, increase the interaction and participation of the audience, whether it is hybrid, in person, doesn't matter. In fact, even if you are physically in a conference room, nothing prevents you from using this because then everyone is participating. So try it out and you'll be surprised how good it is. In fact, in a mobile phone on Teams app also this works. You can either type or scribble. This works on Teams, on desktop, mobile, browser, everywhere. And as though that is not enough, Microsoft 365 has Whiteboard is an independent app also if you like that way. Next, post meeting follow up. Now what happens? We are doing so many meetings. There are so many applications you can use for audio call, video call, screen sharing, right? What is common amongst all those tools? Everyone has a start button. Everyone has an end meeting button. Very good. Now meeting is finished. My job is not finished, but why? Because some follow up is required. If the meeting happened, but none of this is required, then you are probably questioning why was the meeting done in the first place? But generally one of these or more of these will be required. Now, none of these apps are going to help you. They say my job is done because you ended the meeting. Now I don't know you, but we have to do the follow up 
So what do we do? The only place which helps us is the calendar. That meeting you will go to. Right click, reply all, and you will send minutes of meeting, files, follow up, actions, updates, all kinds of mails. Everyone is getting it by the way. Reply all, reply all, reply all. So it's an exponential inefficiency. But we didn't seem to have a choice. Now we have. So Teams is smart. Teams says, where did you do the meeting? It was a Teams meeting. So I know who attended, right? So why are you frustrating yourself and everyone else by cluttering each other's mailbox? Stop doing that. So what should you do then? Nothing. When a meeting is over, right? The meeting is over. But that same meeting with the same participants automatically appears in your chat in Teams. Many people think it is an irritating feature, but look at it this way. Why is it appearing in chat? In the chat, the same participants are there. So now you have an opportunity of not sending them emails and continuing that collaboration in chat itself. So earlier it was a meeting in calendar. You went to the calendar and attended the meeting, but then you started some audio video recording, your transcript, you had notes, your whiteboard, all of them will be available to you after the meeting also. You can upload files after the meeting. The whiteboard is not a bitmap. That whiteboard is alive and can continue to collaborate lifelong if you like. So stop sending emails for post-meeting collaboration and start using Teams meeting related chat. Great. Now, when it comes to chat, why do people use chat in the first place for communication, right? Now, when I need inputs from someone, I have multiple ways of getting those inputs. So two broad methods. If the inputs I need are not urgent, probably I will send a mail and wait for the mail to come, the reply to come. But very often we need something urgently and we can't wait for a mail to be replied to. So what is fast? Chat is fast. The problem is, of course, chat is fast, but with chat. That's the problem because many of us are already used to using all kinds of personal chat applications for day-to-day -day personal work at least. So we just continue using the same software for corporate communication. That is a very, very dangerous thing. Probably you already have a compliance policy, but all compliance policies are not probably strictly followed, especially in the context of personal chat because everyone is so used to it, we just find it difficult to move away from it. It is like uh, earbuds. When you buy earbuds, the packet clearly says, do not put it in the ear, but still most of the people do it and create damage also many times. So same situation here. Now, remember, why am I saying putting data on personal chat is bad? I am not saying it. Your compliance team is saying, why? Because when you put data on personal chat applications, you expose yourself, your business and your customers data to a lot of risks. All these can happen together, by the way. And many people may not know this in so many words. But now how do you convince users to actually start using, stop using the personal chat and use? You can't just ask them to stop, isn't it? You have to give them an alternative. Yes, we are trying to convince them by showing the threat and security risk and privacy risk, all that. But they say, okay, Give me an alternative. So that's the idea. So why is personal chat bad? Not because I am saying. By the way, Microsoft has a cloud firewall. It's called Microsoft Defender for Cloud. That has a comprehensive catalog of 30,000 applications, all SaaS applications in the world. And that keeps getting added. more apps get added very often. So this cloud app catalog has 30,000 plus applications, but currently we are seeing only 75 because I have filtered it on personal chat apps, as you can see here. Now you'll notice each app has a score. 10 is the maximum score. So WhatsApp has a score of six. Now you'll ask me, why is WhatsApp having a score of six? It's not because it's not a Microsoft product. Google has a score of nine. So why does WhatsApp have score of six? Well, that is derived from various parameters which are neutrally monitored. So they have not taken the trouble to implement these security protocols or requirements or regulations. Similarly, a lot of compliance requirements have not been met with. That is why the score is low and that is your risk, isn't it? Now, when it comes to teams, obviously, it has a score of 10. Actually, not obviously. 
it doesn't have a score of 10 because it's a Microsoft product. Microsoft has actually complied with all these security and compliance requirements and legal requirements. Now, does it happen easily? No. Each one of them is a complex document. Lots of work to be done, lots of processes to be changed, change management to be done at people level. Monitoring, audit, internal, external. Each tick mark is probably, I don't know how many million per tick mark, but still Microsoft has done it. WhatsApp has not done it. Now think, why not? WhatsApp is also Facebook. They have lots of money, lots of talent. Technically, they can do it. Why have they not done it? And why has Microsoft done it? Do they want to waste money? No. The reason is the use case. Who is going to use WhatsApp? WhatsApp is designed for consumers. Consumers don't need all this level of security and compliance. That's why WhatsApp or Facebook decided not to implement it. Whereas Teams is created for corporate enterprise use. So obviously all these are absolutely required. That's why Microsoft has put in the effort and done it. Now, having said that, what do we want to do? We want to tell all this to users and say, now onwards, for your safety, personally, as well as corporate data safety, why don't we use Team Chat now? Because it's way secure, as you can see, and it has many more capabilities. So what are the capabilities Team Chat has? Before we go there, Suppose someone calls you or you call someone, you are the boss, call someone saying, give this customer 50% discount. You are talking to a very junior person. That person knows you are very senior, but still, if you tell this on a chat or SMS or a phone call, nobody is going to listen to you. They will say, put it on email. Then I will do it. Why are people worried about putting everything on official email? Because that protects their interest. They know that. And why does that happen? Because as per regulatory requirements, we have legal hold and stuff like that. And retention period where even if I delete the mail from my mailbox or the other party does, I will, I means the IT or compliance team will have that archive which can be used to protect my interests and corporate interests. But the only problem with this is this is slow. So now we have to tell people if you want something fast, by all means, use Teams chat because Teams chat has the same policy which can be applied exactly like email. So all the compliance requirements are taken care of and later on you want to search, you can search across mailboxes as well as across Teams and chat, which is very good. So everything is better when you start using team chat. Team chat supports all kinds of security compliance, information protection, e-discovery, even information barriers and so on. So it's really secure and it is efficient. So you should promote this saying, this is giving you all three. Why don't you try it at least and then decide whether you want to move away from personal chat applications, at least for corporate communication. It's in everyone's interest to do so. Chat has many, many features. Some of them we will see later, but many people have not even compared Teams chat with something which they're already familiar with. And that's probably the reason. Initial phases of teams also had some teething troubles, performance problems and so on, but now absolutely no problem. So another very great feature of teams is in a group chat, any other chat software, there is a group of four people, you put a file, all four of them open it, there'll be four copies, right? In case of teams, that doesn't happen. Even if it's a group chat, even if you upload a file, all four people open it, it's one file. Why? Because team chat for file management uses OneDrive. So it automatically goes to the OneDrive of the person who uploaded it and other parties are given edit permission. So even if everyone edits it, it's still a single file and no copy paste is involved. Like that, there are so many benefits of putting your file on OneDrive. So what happens is one of the things about OneDrive, we will see later, but let's divert a little and look at a mail which comes to you every day. What is the mail? It's called daily briefing. Earlier it was called Kotana daily briefing. Now it's called Viva daily briefing. Never mind what it is called, but typically in the morning or just when you're about to start your day, you will receive an email with subject called daily briefing. What does it do? Well, 
it actually analyzes the responses and emails you are writing to each other. It uses AI. There is nobody reading your mail and this only you can see, not even administrator because everyone gets personalized email basically. And what is it doing? It is looking at what you are telling people. Have you said I will do something and maybe you have forgotten about it because you never added it as a task maybe. So it's saying three days ago you have told someone that I will, if you approve, I will upload the videos. Have you done it? If you have done it, click on done. Otherwise, say remind me. It will add a task for you. Like that, it also gives a nice ability if you are replying to someone for a current mail. Is there something in the communication with that person in the past which you have not finished delivering yet? So it has actually detected that and saying you may have outstanding tasks for this person. Would you like to see? And see how intelligently it is guiding you into utilizing your time well and protecting your interests against common problems like committing something and completely forgetting about it. This Viva Daily Briefing is a part of a larger thing called Viva Insights. This also is available for free for all SQs. Yes, there is an enterprise edition of Viva Insights, but that's for management and for um, man managers and top management. Here we are talking about individualized insights. What does that mean? Whatever you are working on, mail, chat, calls, meetings, presentations, all that data already Microsoft has because you are using Microsoft platform for it. So it uses that data, same data, analyzes it in an intelligent manner and gives you uh, very, very useful inputs and guidance about how to improve focus, how to improve well-being, which are the people whom you are interacting with and then all kinds of collaborative inputs. So if you have not gone to Viva Insights, go to office.com, log in using corporate ID, click on Viva Insights and see for yourself. Each of these categories when you further go down gives you actionable insights plus some guidance about how to improve your work and efficiency. So these are really useful. They happen automatically. It's just a question of going there periodically and using it to your advantage. Now, another thing where we struggle is bookings of time. I am the boss. I have 20 direct reports and I need to sit with them one-on-one -on -one separately every quarter for whatever, 30 minutes. So now I have to block appointments with 20 people. A lot of time goes in finding the common time available and rescheduling and all that. Now, even if you are the boss and I am an admin assistant, for that admin assistant also, this is a mundane job. You could have used that time for something more value adding. So that is where this brilliant thing called booking comes into picture. It's a part of Office 365. It's like Calendly where you can publish available slots. So I want 20 slots. So you say, okay, get started. It will ask you, what is your schedule you are looking for? So I've said my individual item will be 30 minutes and I will do those kind of meetings on Monday and Friday or whatever you define. So you define whatever time slots you want. And once that is done, it will give you a link. Now that link, what happens? You send it to those 20 people. That's it. And then what happens? When they click on the link, whoever clicks on the link will see Available date, available slots, they click on it and it is blocked. Blocked in your calendar and of course there will be sent a team meeting request as well. And the next person who comes in will not see this slot because it's already occupied. It is such a powerful tool sitting right there in Office 365 platform already integrated with Outlook and everything else. So please start using. Remember you can also use it externally and the other party does not need any special software. In fact, in some industries that time may be chargeable, it may be consulting. So that is also available if you need to. All right. So this is a great feature which is completely underutilized. Please start using it. In case you don't see the bookings logo in office.com, request your IT to enable it. Now many times we need to automate things, unstructured processes typically. Because structured process is already automated. Unstructured processes, who is doing? Users. Using what? Random word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, OneNote, Chat, whatever comes to their mind. 
as long as the work is getting done, nobody is really bothered. And this is not a new process I'm talking about. These kind of ad hoc processes are required for business, but running randomly. So you can now streamline them, automate them using Power Automate. Power Automate is like Outlook rules. In Outlook, what do we say when a mail comes from a particular person, which is now called trigger, you do some action, typically move it to a folder, forward it to someone, something like that. Even our out of office is a workflow sort of. Trigger is a mail coming in, action is whatever standard message is going on. Now this happens only in Outlook, but what we are interested in is automation across apps. And there are so many apps in Microsoft platform itself. So Power Automate gives you the ability to have trigger anywhere, action anywhere. Suddenly it liberates you completely because those things you may actually be doing repeatedly and manually every now and then. So here are the examples. When a mail comes, look at the particular mail for some subjects and look whether there is an attachment and then put the attachment in OneDrive or Team or SharePoint or wherever you like. Even other third party products are supported. Now maybe you are monitoring your Twitter and for some hashtags or your handle and then whenever something new happens, you want to create a log in Excel. Very easily you can do using Power Automate without any programming. Similarly, feedback is submitted. I want to send a thank you mail or apology mail depending on how the customer responded. All these otherwise would require either manual work or intense programming from IT team. Now it can be done automatically without programming. So please explore Power Automate. It is available as a part of every Office 365 SKU as well as the Outlook.com, which is the personal free version also. Really powerful. It doesn't just integrate with Microsoft products. It integrates with 600 plus different applications. So probably the apps you are using are already there. Maybe you have some business apps. You can even create connectors for them. So it's a really empowering thing for all users to know about it. Exactly what they'll do, they will decide once they know what it is capable of. Awareness is more important. When people are aware of, oh, this thing does that. Ah, now I can think, I will use it there. So that is how awareness first, then business mapping, and then hands-on skills. So what kind of automation can it do? The trigger and action, which is what I just told about. We can think of all kinds of business scenarios there. Another one is on demand. When there is an emergency or let's say there is a um, urgent call from customer, certain things have to be done in your data center or in your support team. Those actions are predefined, but when those actions will be invoked is on demand. So you just create a button. You have to manually press the button, then all the actions will happen automatically. Another example is mail merge. Why am I saying mail merge? Because very often people need mail merge, which can happen in Word also. But people require mail merge in such a way that there is a mail going, which is customized with the name. That's okay. But people also want to send an attachment, which is defined by per person basis. So now that cannot be done in Word. It can be done quite easily using Power Automate. But how will you invoke the mail merge? There is no trigger. So you are the trigger. You press the button, then it will pick up the desired data and send it. Now all kinds of approvals are happening all the time in the world in an ad hoc manner. That also is built in. Serial parallel approvals are there. Templates are there and it integrates with teams as well extremely well. Finally, it's scheduled tasks like birthday wishes, task reminders, where the trigger is time. So you can say do this every day at 8.30 in the morning. Look at my task list, find out what is today's date. Look at the task, filter them by things which are appearing today or those are delayed and then give me a reminder, delegate it to someone, whatever may be the action. Another interesting example is many people forget to wish people on birthdays. So you can have a list of birthdays in Excel or some data source and ask a Power Automate to wake up every day at uh, say 11.45 in the night, scan the list, look at the date, match the date and correct time, send the birthday wishes to the relevant party. Remember, it need not be only mail. There are 600 applications it integrates with. It also is capable of sending a push notification on mobile. So very, very powerful set of features. This is an example of a flow. 
I am capturing a feedback. Feedback form is already there. Everyone is going to fill it. But as soon as someone fills it, I don't want to waste time looking at it and then manually doing something. So I've said, look at that feedback. Look at the parameters I've given or the fields I'm capturing. One of them is score. If it is below three, what to do? If it is above three, what to do? Apology mail, thank you mail. It's just very easy. There are many templates available. You don't have to start from scratch. It is also available on mobile. And you go to the templates, search for the application which you intend to automate. And I'm sure you will find lots of ready to use templates. And that's the best way of learning. And then of course you can customize it. Incidentally, Power Automate also has RPA, which is really powerful, which is basically desktop based RPA, screen scraping, automation of tasks across applications which are not automatable and so on. Now the next best practice is again about collaboration, external sharing. What does that mean? Many people are putting files on OneDrive, Teams, all that. Good. But when it comes to sharing the file, most people are still attaching files. That's a bad idea. And very often, why are they attaching files? Because either they don't know, they can share a link or it has been blocked by IT. So please don't block external sharing. Why am I saying that? Because once you put a file on OneDrive, you get so many benefits automatically. So first ask people, at least the new file should go on OneDrive. Any file which belongs to a project should go into the relevant team. But then the benefits which are auto, 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 you are going to accrue them anyway. You don't have to do anything extra. Just put the file on cloud. By putting the file on OneDrive, you still have a local copy which is synced. So you can still edit it offline. The sync will happen whenever you get connected. So all these benefits are almost implicit. You don't have to put extra effort. But the biggest benefit of cloud storage is the way we work with files with each other. So now what am I saying? Stop sending those files to each other and start sending links. How do you send a link? Well, you don't go to Outlook. You don't say insert attachment. Assuming you're in Word, Excel, PowerPoint itself, you can just click on the share button. By the way, these things need not be just Word, Excel, PowerPoint. There can be text file, Photoshop file, Corel Draw file, doesn't matter. If those kind of files are there will be a no share button. So you go to file explorer, right click there, the share button is there. In either case, you get to see various options, which you never had before. Earlier, when we sent an attachment, the attachment is gone forever and you will never know what happened to it. Maybe the other party edits it and send it back, but you still don't know what that person is going to do with the copy they already have. They can forward it. You have no visibility, no control, no audit trail. That's why attachments are bad and you should discourage them. Whereas here, what am I saying? I will specify the people. I will decide whether to allow editing. I will decide uh, whether to block download. And if I change my mind, I can remove the permission or give more permission. It's entirely up to me. That's empowering. We have never had that control before. So as you might have put one, two people's names or email IDs, assistant is in-house person, means staff. And obviously the other one is an external party. So many customers have blocked external sharing for some reason, thinking that it is less secure. First of all, sending attachments, you have been doing it for 30 years. Do you think it is secure? Do you have audit trail? Do you have DLP covering every mail which goes out? Probably not. Maybe your mail logs. Is there someone going through them on a daily basis thinking of whether some pilferage is happening? Probably not. So please allow external parties to be included in sharing of links. That's what I'm trying to urge you to do. Why am I saying that? Because when this mail goes to this person versus this person, what is the difference? This is an internal person already logged in. Click on the link, file will open, they can edit, whatever. But when you click on the external mail ID, that is a security risk, agreed. So that person to whom I have sent this has to prove that that person owns that email ID. How do, you, how do you do that? It shows you when you click on the link, it will not open the file. It will say, okay, type your email. That's not enough. After you say type the email, it will send an OTP and then ask for the code to be entered. And only when that OTP is entered, the file will open. And the good part about this is the file, even if you forward further, 
the link is not going to work for people who were not specified in the email. So security improved, productivity improved, compliance improved, all of the above. That's how it is beautiful. So what am I saying? There are lots of benefits of external sharing files as links. And I'm listing out the benefits here and think, are these benefits applicable to attachments? Obviously not. That is why I'm saying encourage rather than block people from sharing external files. So if you prevent people from sharing links like this, what are they going to do? They're going to attach and that's extra work for them and higher security risk. That's the problem. If the file is bigger than say 30 MB or whatever is your email quota, they can't even mail it there. They are going to find some random cloud provider and increase your organizational risk because those cloud providers which are typically used for just file sending may or may not be secure at all. So because of these reasons, encourage and enable sharing of links internally and externally. And of course, attach files only if mandatory. So these are the common reasons why you have to send an attachment. Viruses have been coming since decades and even today the commonest threat vector or where the viruses enter from remains to be macros and macros are in typically Word, Excel, PowerPoint. So you may be tempted to think that these are coming in Word, Excel, PowerPoint files, which is Microsoft. They're coming through Exchange and Outlook, which is Microsoft. So is Microsoft platform not secure? No, absolutely not. When Microsoft created the Visual Basic language, like any other language created by anybody, it can be used for good or bad things. So how do you differentiate between the two? That is the question. So that setting has always been there for 28 years, I think. Where is that setting? You go to either Word, Excel, PowerPoint or Outlook, doesn't matter, one of them, it will reflect everywhere. Then you go to File, Options, and under that you will see Trust Center, then go to Trust Center Settings. When you go there, there are lots of settings, one of which is macro settings. Now there are four options. This disable all is very dangerous, so you can't do it. Sorry, disable all is not a good idea because some people may have regular useful macros. Enable all macros, also bad because viruses will run without warning. So what Microsoft did long back is they used this as a default. Disable VBA macros with notification. And that default has remained there for 30 years. Nobody has changed that default. Ideally, the correct thing should be this. Why? Because digital signature requires you to identify yourself. So a hacker doesn't want them to be identified and penalized. So they are never going to write code which is digitally signed, which can directly lead to them. It's stupid. So that is why if this code is digitally signed, that means it is safe. Because what is a digital signature? Your organization has to procure it and sign the macros. But then that may be very painful and you don't want to spend extra. So what do you do? If you just disable macros, unless they are signed and there are users in your company who have actually created and they are using macros for their own official work, they will obviously crib and shout at you. So how do you solve that problem? Microsoft has thought of that also. Once you set this, a macro will not run it unless it is digitally signed. Now, how do you sign? Well, you have a self-cert.exe. This is a compromise, means mini version of certificate. The proper certificate, which is called authentic code certificate, needs to be purchased from a certifying authority, obviously. But this is something which will run only on that machine. So user has created some macros. I want to run those macros because they are part of business work. But now I can't run them because it's asking for certificate. No problem. Go to your office folder, you will find this file, double click on it and that user can create a certificate for himself or herself. It will be installed on that machine only and it will only work on that machine. So now once that certificate is created, now you go to your visual basic code and go to digital signature option and choose the certificate, job done. So once you do this, you are already safe from macro viruses. Even if you don't have any antivirus, you will not get macroviruses, end of story. Because we have only allowed known things and we have blocked unknown things. 
simple and effective. Now, passwordless. Many people probably are not even on multi-factor. If you are just using passwords to log in, I am sorry to say, but it is absolutely inadequate to prevent against current threats. Multi-factor for factor authentication means what? Lowest level of security is passwords because first of all, people struggle to create new passwords. They modify the previous password. All kinds of jugglery users do. And of course, it is irritating also because you have to keep thinking of a complex password every now and then. A better version of it from a security point of view at least is password plus OTP, which typically comes as an SMS, phone call or the authenticator app, which is good. But this is even more painful because I still have to keep changing passwords and add and type something extra. So the best way of improving efficiency plus security is directly to move to passwordless authentication, not just for IT, not just for top management, for every user. This is a feature of Active Directory. So how does it work? It comes with all sorts of Active Directory. No extra purchase is required. If you are not using Active Directory and using some other directory, every directory provider or authentication provider gives you passwordless sign in. So how does it work? When I'm logging in, username, yes, password is not asked at all. Just two digit number is shown. Now, what do I do with it? Look at your mobile. You will have received a notification with three numbers. Choose the correct number, click approve, and you're logged in without password. This is 100 times safer than what we do with password. So please implement it immediately. Show this demo to your bosses. They will love it. And then they will help you implement it for all users. Please urgently do this. This, where is this enabled? It is in Active Directory, security, authentication methods. You can add passwordless. More documentation, of course, is available on Microsoft. Now, for local desktop logins, also people are using username, password, typically email ID and password. That is also a bad idea. Even for Windows login, you should completely eliminate passwords. And that can be done using Windows Hello, which requires a dual camera, one infrared. Every laptop and PC may not have such a camera. So if you have, by all means, use this. This is the safest one of the lot. But if you don't have that kind of capability or camera, no problem. Use PIN instead of username password. Yes, this password looks very long, complex and scary, but actually that small little four digit PIN is safer than this password. Why is it safe? Because if I tell you my PIN, in fact, my machine the actual PIN is 2143. You can't misuse it at all because that PIN will run only if you come to my house and open my laptop and then type it on nowhere else on any other network or any other device it is going to work. That is why it is safe. So please convert this password based login to pin based login. And again, your security teacher will suddenly improve less effort, more impact security plus productivity. So that's how this works. Now, if you have Office 365, Business Standard, Premium F1, E1, whatever kind of business suit from Microsoft, either Office or Microsoft 365, every customer gets to see three scores or three numbers. Those three numbers are security score, compliance score, productivity score. Security score is in the security area under admin, compliance is under compliance portal under admin and productivity score is under reports. Now, what do you do with the score? Well, you look at it. You can read up as to how it is calculated. The breakdown is also usually given below. And then you take improvement actions. That's the idea. Now look at the compliance score. It's very interesting. I've got 60% score. And look at what it is saying. How did I get that score? I have not done anything for compliance actually. Because Microsoft has done it. No? So what are you worried about when you are talking about uh, compliance, privacy, all that? Data should not leak, it should not be misused, customer data is valuable, and employee data is valuable, all, all that. So what are we trying to protect against? Misuse of that data. That's why there are compliance regulations. Agree. Now, when you put your data on Microsoft, you become Microsoft's customer. So they also have not just the same, many more regulations to comply with. 
So Microsoft has to follow all global guidelines and compliance and security requirements plus US government ones plus all industries because Microsoft has customers from across industries and regional as well. So that is the benefit. Once you put your data on Microsoft, you are automatically getting the benefit of all these security and compliance standards, which Microsoft is anyway going to apply to your data. And that is why when you look at the compliance score, you will see that I have already got 12,000 points because Microsoft has done the job. So by putting your data on Microsoft Cloud and potentially any other well-managed cloud, you are going to get a super set of benefit in terms of security and compliance. Remember that. So now the question is, how do we increase those scores? For each of those scores, there is guidance and actionable insights given below. So these come in different categories depending on what kind of configuration you have and it may keep on changing depending on the features which are added to products as well as the threat perceptions. But it does give you a com comprehensive list of action items. It tells you if you do this, how will how much your score will increase. And it also gives you details about how exactly to go about doing it. Now it doesn't mean you always have to use some Microsoft tool to do it. You can always say I did it using some other third party tool and you will get the benefit of increment in that score. The bigger question is, are people looking at this score on a regular basis? And if yes, who? And who is responsible for increasing it? So obviously it looks like security team should look at security score. Compliance team should look at compliance score. <laughs> Productivity score, God knows who is looking at anyway. No, that's not the way it should be done because security score, some things will affect compliance and vice versa. And definitely all of them will affect productivity and vice versa. So this is not an isolated job of one team or the other team. You have to actually form a team first with top management because they have the biggest risk and the biggest reward in case something goes wrong. Biggest risk in case this is well managed, they are protecting the entire organizational as well as personal interests very well. So this should be shown to top management and as a combined team cross-functional Together, you should sit periodically, look at the score, set the baseline, whatever it is, and then prioritize action items and implement them. Even though the actual implementation may be done by IT team or security or compliance, all these things require a lot of user related activities and convincing and change management. So it is best to have top management involved so that they can propagate the change and expedite things in the process. Everyone benefits. So that's how these scores are really useful. If you have not looked at them, do it immediately and have a plan and a team to enhance them. Finally, all users must be educated. Why am I saying that? Because many customers I have seen buying Office 365, whatever F1, E1, business premium, standard, whatever it is, for hundreds, thousands, whatever number of users. Good. Now, obviously, they have to use it. So we have deployed. People have that. But people are still not using. That means what they are not using. That means you're not practically getting any benefit, but you're still paying the subscription. That's poor return on investment, poor cost benefit analysis. So in order to just do that, don't you think you have to train the users? Maybe when you got Office 365, you did conduct some training, but think about how many training programs you have conducted and for whom. Maybe few training programs, each attended by different users. So a subset of users were taught a subset of features. That's a problem. And that is why in order to maximize efficiency as well as your return on investment, this is an absolute no-brainer, but unfortunately, not a single customer has done it to my knowledge. What do you have to do? Nothing great. We don't have to worry about senior, junior, which department, what persona, this is unstructured work. There is no persona. Everyone is unstructured. So you have to broadly categorize what kind of people are people working on. They are creating files, mails, documents, presentations. They are storing them somewhere. They can't do it alone because they need input. So they are collaborating. Why are they doing all this? Because they are executing their work and they always get more and more data. So they need to analyze and maybe they are doing something repetitive. They have hopes of automation. These are universal needs. They don't depend on your position, designation, seniority, industry, country. And for these generic 
and universally applicable needs, Microsoft 365 has solutions. Now, have you seen this kind of view of why there are so many tools? If you just show them icons, people get bored saying, I don't want to look at all these. I don't have time. My work is getting done in Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Don't trouble me. I, I don't want to learn. But when you educate people and every user, I'm saying, even if they have the lowest queue, doesn't matter. Even if they don't have office, they say, let them come and understand. What are we trying to teach? Two hour session, not hands-on deep dive, nothing. At least they should know this tool does this. And this is the ideal tool for it. This is not the ideal tool for it. Like I said, Excel is bad for data entry. List is good for data entry. Same way, when you are storing files, my files go to OneDrive. Departmental files go to SharePoint. Ideally, they should go to Teams. And project-specific files go to Teams. But wait, if any of those files is a video, then it doesn't go anywhere else. It goes to stream because it's a streaming server. Like that, you teach people. It's not complex. You can conduct that training yourself. And even if you have thousands of people in your staff, a team's live event now has a capacity of 1 lakh or 100,000 people. So irrespective of how large your entire staff strength is, with few events like this, with internal talent, at least you can spread awareness about every tool and which one to use when in the minds of all the users and then the users themselves will be able to map oh this i didn't know now i know i can visualize i can use it here you can you will start getting inputs from them and that is called applied knowledge you can even gamify it if required and by doing all this what are we achieving we are actually achieving effective use of the technology and obviously it is going to increase your investment uh, return on investment of and directly impact people's efficiency. In order to make it even better, you can do something more. Let's see what we can do. But before we see that, this whole thing is called Office 365. Now, some of all these apps, except for a couple of them, which are purely browser-based, all of them are available on mobile. Again, I have seen most IT people reluctant to put all these apps because they think it's a risk, security problem. If it was a security problem, would Microsoft have created it? If it is a security problem for you, it is equally a security problem for Microsoft because you are their customer. So it's a shared responsibility. Why is Microsoft going to increase their liability and their financial risk? No, give these apps. These are really functional apps. Even Word, Excel, PowerPoint is really functional on mobile phone. Give people the apps so that they can truly utilize mobility and actually work from anywhere, which is what is the current demand anyway. And then all these things, some run mobile, some run on desktop, some run on browser, some run on all three, but many of them also run on Windows. So Office 365 plus Windows and we need security and compliance also. So all this put together is Microsoft 365 and that's the platform. And if you have that, teach it to all users. Now the last one, this is the most powerful one, so I kept it till last. If you ask me in last 20 years, what has Microsoft done completely innovative and revolutionary? It is called Loop. It's a recent addition, couple of months back. It is still getting rolled out worldwide. It is being introduced as a part of Teams. So what does this do? Let's see an example. Let's say I have, I am in a group chat. So this is a group chat with five people. And I want these people to contribute some numbers. What is the number for May, June, July? I have put a table. By the way, most chat software applications don't even give you a table. Teams does. So, okay, good. I used the table. But this is chat, remember. What is going to happen when I say send? That table becomes my message. Now, in any chat software in the world, including Teams, my message cannot be edited by others. They can reply to it, but then that reply will come down. Then someone else is replying to the reply. Some other unrelated talk is going on. So this will completely go haywire. I am not going to get three numbers quickly from there. Impossible. Now what will I do? This is not going to work. I know it even without doing it. So I'm going to send a file, an email, a table, Word, Excel. Again, we are wasting each other's time. But genuinely, in this case, we did not have a better way of doing it. But now we have. So instead of creating that table, 
look at this. This is called loop component. If you click on it, what happens? It gives you things which look very familiar. Bulleted list, checklist, numbered list. This is available in Word, PowerPoint, OneNote, Outlook, Paragraph, of course, so many places. Table, which is again universal, and a task list. So what is special? I just created a table and it didn't work for me. But wait, this is a loop table. It's revolutionary, remember? So I'm adding a table. It looks almost the same. It just gives you a title, but that's okay. I'm still saying same thing. And when I say send, what happens? Now when I say send, of course I can edit it because it's my message. No, but that's not all. Now another person is also editing it and I can see it live and I that person can see what I'm doing live. And whether it happens live or otherwise, everyone's changes are going to get combined in the same table. It's like working on the same file together with OneDrive or Teams, same thing happening here, but not on a file, on a component of a file. So this is revolutionary because it saves you so much trouble of sending mail trails and attachments and copy paste. Not only that, this is available in Teams, chat and browser, on desktop, on mobile, everywhere. And as though this is not enough, very soon it is coming up in Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, OneNote, everywhere. The table remains the same, means whether I send this table as email or I send it as Word or PowerPoint or whatever, people are editing in different places, in different ways, in different containers, but the table is still single and it gets automatically synced. Beautiful. So essentially, what are these? If you look at a complex document, it is composed of these components. So instead of sharing a document, we are sharing a small part of it and making our collaboration more granular. So it's a container independent co-authoring of small components of documents. Very, very powerful. So this is the most revolutionary feature which I feel has come in last 20 years. Now, once you start using all this and people start benefiting from it, here is an example of what work I did for a bank. These were financial controllers. They sat with me first. They showed me what work they do. I said, okay, each activity, how much time you are taking, this much time. Now, how much time you are taking? I optimize that activity and look at the after time. Our days of work is getting converted to minutes. That is the real potential of Office Platform. And although that potential has always been there for decades, Hardly any customer has realized, even realized that this much potential is there, leave alone actually accruing and converting that potential into reality. Is that difficult? No, it's just lack of awareness. And once awareness is created, for example, now you know the action. Who is going to take the action? That's a problem because purchasing Office 365, CFO and IT will do, deployment IT will do, security, security, compliance, compliance, productivity. Nobody's care. Yes, HR will do some training, but as I said, subset of people are taught subset of tools. So nobody is responsible. That's the problem. So how do you solve the problem? Change management. But let's not go into complexity. A simple, effective process of maximizing efficiency across the organization and fully utilizing the platform and giving unimaginable benefit and ROI. Four-step process. First thing, whatever I'm talking about should be known to whom? The biggest beneficiary, which is the top management. Because what is their job? To make the business grow. If you do all this and people save 30 minutes every day, can't we use the same people for doing more things with no additional hiring cost? So it is absolutely what leaders are looking for. Growth drivers. How to grow? The low-hanging fruit is office and nobody has realized it. But now that they realize it, then they will say, let's train everyone because otherwise it's only a potential. How do you get it into reality? Everyone has to know. That's why I said teach everyone. Now everyone is aware. Now people will come to use with use cases, find out which are the best methods available, convert them to standard operating procedures or best practices. Like I have shown you 15 SOPs today. But don't stop at that. There are thousands of features and thousands of business requirements. Someone has to map them, who is going to do that? So that is a good, very good question. There is no partner there. I can do it, but how many companies will I go to? So idea is, bosses know the benefit? Yes. So tell your leaders 
from every department you give me two people and officially allow them to study and learn this platform maybe two hours in 15 days whatever time you want and when people learn what is available then they can think in my department i can apply it here and we can standardize this make this a best practice make this an sop every month they submit such things and top management sits together finalizes the sops and then you release the sops when i say you who bosses release the sops not trainer not champion not it only bosses mail is read everything else is secondary so each boss sends a mail to all their subordinates and then because boss has said the chances of this getting implemented is very quick and change management becomes a cake walk so with this with champions you can actually have long term sustained practically unlimited impact and this in initial process of course you can do it yourself you can invite me i have done it for lots of customers in fact during covid itself i have done 400 plus sessions for across seven countries but the idea is understand this and just buying and just doing random training is absolutely not going to cut it and in fact you are wasting money by doing that so with that i am going to end my session now in today's session i covered only 15 best practices but i have you will know that office 365 has so many tools isn't it so every tool every user should know yes awareness is fine but in every tool there are some bare minimum things every user must know whether they find it useful or not they will decide for themselves but they must know not necessarily hands on they should know this is how you use this tool currently i have covered 15 out of them but i wrote a book recently which covers 130 out of these and this covers all these tools which you are seeing here so if you have not seen my book just check it out on amazon this is the qr code for that and see if you find it useful so with that i am going to end this session thank you for your patience